Barrister Aloy Ejimako, thank you for your time with us today. It's my pleasure having you. Make I just start by asking this question. You don't see Namdi Kanu? Yes. Um, first of all, for the benefit of the viewers, um, what I'm about to say will be best expressed in English term pigeon. So I must apologize for that because legal terms will be occurring here a lot today. Yes, I met him yesterday for almost three hours at the headquarters of the DSS in Abuja. And we had quite an interaction, private interaction initially. And later on, he was interviewed by three DSS officers in my presence. I wanted to call it an interrogation, but they said, no, it's an interview, uh, during which they asked him routine questions. But most of the questions centered uh, on his being the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra and the activities of that organization. So he answered the questions uh, in a relaxed atmosphere uh, with bearing in mind his constitutional rights not to incriminate himself. Of course, um, some of the questions um, had background information that he considered incomplete and he told the officers that he was not able to answer some of those questions because uh, the information that they supplied to him was incomplete. So the interview went without incident and um, at some point it was brought to a close. I think maybe there's going to be another uh, interview to be scheduled but I have not been informed of that yet. And you go day in that other interview, you go day with your client, Namdi Kanu, for those other interviews will go happen after today. Will he go? You go day with your yes, client. Yes, yes, yes. I go day with her. I, I normally, uh, his right to counsel has attached. So any further interview, whether it's called interview or interrogation, any interaction on the matter as to what he did or what he didn't do or the allegations, can never occur without presence of counsel. If it does, you'll be tempted and you'll be inadmissible in court. Okay, so before we talk more about this, you talk, say, aside from the interview your client Namdi Kanu gets with the DSS officers, you also get private interaction with them. Yes. Before we go into details uh, on that, in as, as much as you can share with us, if you describe to us when you see Namdi Kanu, how it be? What is this is in state of mind? Well, uh, he, his state of mind wasn't as uh, sound as it should be. You know, uh, if you listen to his broadcast, uh, you would know that he's a historian. But when I was talking with him, he had trouble recalling the actual date he was abducted. It surprised me. So to jog his memory, I asked him how many nights he, he spent in Abuja before he was, he was brought to court. He told me two nights. So he was brought to court on Tuesday, the 29th June. So we, we figured he must have been brought into the country on Sunday, the 27th. So when I mentioned that date, he said, sure, that's the date. But I, I took particular note of that. I also noticed that he had a visible injury on his right wrist. I asked him what it was. He said it was the, where they had chained him the chain on him and chained him to the concrete floor in Nairobi, Kenya. And he has disappearing injury on the left wrist and an injury right here at the nape of the neck. So he related to me, I asked him what happened and what happened, much of it is now public knowledge. So what I'm doing is uh, what, by way of adumbration, supplying more information. You could tell us more about what happened because you talk about you just mentioned Kenya and Kenyan government don't come out to talk, say, they're not arrest in Amkano for Kenya. So well, tell us yeah. more about yes, what this. Happened? What happened is this. Uh, Mazin Amkano entered Kenya, uh, I believe, on a certain date, uh, right around April this year. I'm not sure. I'm trying to establish the actual date of entry. But I have documentation from a Kenyan hospital that placed him in Kenya as of 14th April this year. 14th May. So he entered Kenya. And what did he do for Kenya Hospital? He went there because he had uh, issues with his heart. He had maybe, he felt he wasn't well. So he went there, he was examined, and the diagnosis was um, 
uh, hypertension and heart murmur. They made prescriptions for him, and my examination of the medical report indicated uh, medications for heart and uh, controlling uh, blood pressure. So apparently he entered Kenya before the, the 14th uh, May this year. So he had settled in at a location in Nairobi, a temporary location, and he entered with his passport. Um, uh, the biographic page of his passport was made available to me as of counsel, and the page bearing the stamp, the immigration stamp that admitted him to Kenya was also made available to me. So I had irrebuttable evidence, independent of what he was going to tell me, that placed him in Kenya before the extraordinary rendition. So when he, that day, on the faithful day, that was on the, I believe on the 19th, yes, not believe, Saturn, 100%, he drove himself to the airport from his temporary location in Kenya. He drove to Jomo Kenyara International and went into the garage, the under, underground garage, to pick up a visitor flying in from outside. Okay, that is not necessary for this uh, discussion, the identity or whatever. So the moment he got into the parking lot, the garage, a group of several men were armed to the teeth. And this now waiting now they can tell you about this what is, he remember of what waiting is, happen before they bring him to Nigeria. This is what he told me and his recollection of this was very, very lucid and clear. Tell us about it. Yeah, so now they, 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 they swooped on him, they gathered and grabbed him. Okay, in a very physical, rough, rough way, and he raised the alarm. Luckily for him, there were a few people that were there, and the people wanted to intervene in terms of really very aggressive intervention, because to them, I asked him why they would consider making an aggressive intervention when something that seemed law enforcement was happening. He said perhaps they didn't believe it was normal. So the People that were abducting him told everybody to stay clear that this person you're looking at is a Nigerian terrorist who assists the Al Shabaab terrorists in Kenya. And apparently, most of the people that wanted to intervene, the Good Samaritans, are Kenyans. And you know, Al Shabaab has quite an extensive uh, um, operation in Kenya, just like we have the Boko Haram here. So perhaps uh, there's this emotional thing about it that they shouldn't. Uh, be saving anybody that is linked to Ashabab. He said in that moment of indecision and maybe uh, reluctance to further intervene, they grabbed him, put him in their car and left and took him to a private residence, not an official detention facility, where they chained him to the floor. For most of the eight days he spent there and they really tortured him, thinking he was Ashabab. So, he kept telling them he wasn't Al Shabab. He had nothing to do with Al Shabab. He kept telling them who he was. Who be these people? Well, I asked him who they are. He told me they are Kenyan security officials. I asked him why. He said the, the insignia, the courage, that he had arrived in Kenya, so he had a bit knowledge of the terrain and how the law enforcement functions and the sort of things they wear, how, you know, that they, they were brazen with weapons openly, it couldn't have been private parties or you know, some rogue agents doing that. He told me that the thing has um, it's, you know, a hundred percent degree of official, official dumb to it. So uh, they took him to that location and they, they were torturing him and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say they really beat him a lot. So, but at some point when he was trying to explain himself, it, it, he told me he was blindfolded most of the time, chained to the floor, bare floor. And uh, he told me that it looks like one of them decided to be a little bit intellectual about the whole thing and went out and maybe got some information, came back and said, hey, listen, he's not what we think he is. They lied to us. And that was when they disclosed to him that, listen, the real purpose of grabbing you was at the behest of the Nigerian government. Nigerian government hired us
to grab you, to abduct you with that information that you are linked to Al Shabaab. He said, okay, you gotta let me go. He said, no, 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 no. We are committed already. We have to hand it over. But the Kenyan government don't clearly talk, say they don't get hand for this, and they don't arrest Namdi Kanu for the ground. And also, the federal government never come out to talk anything about yes. where your client, yes. where they arrest your client okay. from. Okay. Anyway, I have, um, you see, it's not going to be a question of he said, uh, she said. I'm a lawyer. I operate on the basis of independent and credible evidence. The Kenyan High Commissioner uh, might have sounded credible to the general public, but information available uh, to me can impeach every single word she uttered, including the word, the denier that, come, that came from the home government. I have immigration stamp placing in Nam Kano in Kenya just uh, 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 two months before his abduction. I have medical evidence placing him at a Kenyan hospital, okay? And uh, he, I have his own word. He's of a man of sound mind. Then, fourthly, after the Guardian newspaper UK broke the news that Mazin Namdekano's British passport was still in Kenya, the following day, Kenyan authorities raided that very location for the first time, where, from where he took off to the airport. So he connect the dots. And what's in your client, Namdi can tell you about how they move him from Kenya as he talk, as you talk, say, tell you, how they to move Nigeria? Him. Yes. You see, he said on the first food day, that was the 27th on Sunday, 27th June, they drove him in a car to Jomo Kiyata International Airport, blindfolded him, and bundled him inside a private jet, like a Lear jet. I asked him if he's a Boeing. Seven, seven, so whatever, or a boss, the big ships. He said, no, it's a normal private jet that you often would see some people owning private jet, that kind of size. And he was the lone passenger in that jet, in that plane, and he didn't clear immigration. They drove him straight, you know, on the tarmac, straight to the plane, and very close to the plane, and put him inside the plane, with Nigerian security officials and left about 12 noon in the afternoon and landed Nigeria same day in the evening, around something after four or to five. You talk about the fact, say, you don't see your client. Uh, you talk about his physical and mental state. Tell us more about his mental state. You talk, say, he seemed to be like, say, he seemed to they forget things. No, you no. Know? That's not what I mean. What I meant is this, that he appears like somebody who has been mentally traumatized. You know, so he's unwilling to talk about one or two things until you prompt him. Like when I prompted him about the date, that's the conclusion I drew. How many nights he spent in Abuja. He no, he's not. He's traumatized. He has trauma. He has mental trauma and physical trauma. And the trauma continues because the first night he spent in Nigeria, he told me, in, in that one he did in the presence of DSS officers, when they asked him if um, he has concerns, certain concerns, he said yes. The first night he was brought to the facility, they put him in a room with a small old mattress and left a very bright light on throughout the night. So he had sleep deprivation of the extreme order. It was the following day, perhaps maybe someone decided uh, it shouldn't be this way. So they put him in a better place. So the trauma continues in terms of his being held in communicado. He's not allowed to have, have contact, you know, like you would expect of a detention facility, except with his visitors. And up to this moment, his visitors have only uh, been lawyers. So, how long it take for them to allow you and your like other lawyers? Well, I've been trying to see him since Friday. Uh, I thought I was going to succeed on Tuesday. I didn't. So, eventually, I succeeded yesterday. So, when I raised a bit of my objection. The officer told me that it was a matter of inconvenience for them. No contact with family members? Not yet. I made requests for that yesterday. Let me talk about the trial where we begin again on the 26th of July. Yes. How prepared Unadi for that trial? 
Well, we are, but there's not going to be any trial. There's going to be trial within trial. What happened to Namdi Kano is, by legal definition, uh, worldwide legal definition, what is called extraordinary rendition. It's a state crime. It's a crime by the state. If a private individual abducts or violently and illegally seizes another individual, it's called kidnapping and is a very, in some jurisdictions, is a capital offense. When state does it, it's called extraordinary rendition. That's what happened. So if you rendered or you renditioned a fugitive or a suspect, you have lost jurisdiction to try that suspect because you committed an international crime. You broke your own laws. You broke the laws of the third state from which territory you renditioned that individual. And you broke the laws of the second state of nationality of that individual. That is what is playing out here. Because we have three divergent but also compliant jurisdictions. The three jurisdictions here, Nigeria, Kenya, and UK, their laws prohibit extraordinary rendition. The only legal pathway to grabbing a suspect from one jurisdiction to another for England, I mean for UK, for Kenya and Nigeria, is through extradition. It has a process. Nigeria has an extradition act, which you can find at the laws of Federation of Nigeria, chapter E25. Kenya has its own. It's called Extradition Commonwealth Countries Act. Britain has its own. The three laws are very similar. So there's no conflict of law here. The only conflict of law is that Nigeria chose to broke its own law, Kenyan law and British law. So that conflict will be ventilated in court to see whether there is jurisdiction to try him for any offense or whether the proper thing to do is it not to return him to the state that he was. Despite the bench warrant that was issued by the Federal High Court here, the bench warrant is not a competent legal document to go into a foreign country and illegally grab a suspect. It's not. It should have become one if Nigerian authorities had submitted the process to extradition proceedings in Kenya and succeeded in the final analysis in getting a warrant or order of extradition, it would have been okay. So the first issue before the court here is not to try Nandi for any criminal offense, but to have a trial within trial. Because extradition uh, is, of course, is an act of forcible abduction. So it's considered torture under the torture convention. And Britain has case authorities where it has asserted extraterritorial jurisdiction, what is otherwise known as universal jurisdiction, to indict and try and uh, imprison those that are engaged in such conduct. And if Nigeria was lucky that this, 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 this did occur on British soil, if it did, we would have had a throw a throwback to 1984 when Nigeria tried it and fell. This one they fell because it was on British soil. They created a man named Omar Odiko and they were they were caught at the airport. It was the same thing. The only thing that differs Diko from Namde Khan is that Khan wasn't created and he was kidnapped in a third state. Diko was kidnapped, created. At the airport, British authorities got suspicious and the whole thing unraveled. 17 men were arrested, four were in prison for between six to eight years and deported when they were out of jail. Nigeria broke, Britain broke diplomatic relations with Nigeria for two years. They expelled the Nigerian ambassador, no, the high commissioner and some diplomatic staff found complicity in that grievous crime. And, uh, it was a whole lot of noise internationally. And Nigeria's subsequent request, formal request, meritorious request for extradition of Diko and the others, other Nigerians wanted who were in the UK, were summarily denied by Britain. So there are definitely, for sure, countervailing measures when a nation tries to commit such a grievous crime. Just because they want to have a suspect before their judicial authorities. There are things that the country should have done right, but they decided not to do it. Okay, so they've been 
calls don't come from different quarters, from different groups, say the federal government must handle this case on the fair note, that the trial must happen, not the canon trial must happen on the fair note. Does this make you optimistic? Fair, tri fair trial. That in Abdikan we must have a we, fair trial. see, there, there is a, it's an oxymoron. It's a, it's, a, it's a contradiction to say that a jurisdiction that broke the laws of three countries and the international law, that's the fourth component, to bring a suspect before that jurisdiction should be expected to give fair trial to such individual. But like I said, we haven't even gotten to that bridge yet. When we get to the bridge of whether he's going to get fair trial or not, we are going to ventilate it. The bridge we have to cross first is the bridge of testing the impact of the jurisdiction of Nigeria to try and arm the canoe for any criminal offenses stemming from the extraordinary rendition. That's where we are. So finally, pretty weighty allegations and accusations against your client and some people where i don't talk to don't talk say now all these things they could bring up during the trial talk about his utterances for radio biafra talk about uh, him asking people to take up arms and commit some atrocities like they said all this will come up during the trial and they say the federal government gets very big, big evidence, weighty evidence against not coming. What thing they go through your client's mind? If they think about the trial, does it make him worried? Nam Kano, especially during his interview with the DSS officers, he explained to them, they asked a question similar to this. He said, what I set out to do is protected under the laws of Federation of Nigeria and under international law, which is self-determination. And I set out to do it through peaceful means of referendum. I was singing referendum like a song. Now, how can you say I committed a crime for pushing something, for holding a protected political opinion? I can give you the quotation, is that cap A, Nine laws of federation of Nigeria, uh, Article 20 and Article 1. It's Nigerian law. But I'm wondering if they are, maybe the Attorney General is not yet aware of it or it hasn't been brought to his attention. So he has what lawyers call an affirmative defense that he hasn't committed any offense by virtue of Section 36, subsection 12 of Nigerian Constitution, which stated clearly that no Nigerian can be tried and convicted for any offense that is not written down in a written law. Self-determination, asking for self-determination or referendum is not an offense. Even asking to secede is not an offense. It's not an offense to ask to secede because they frame the charge in terms of you, Mazin Nam De Kam committed an offense because of you ask that you, are, you said you are going to secede. So that question really is self-explanatory from the way he put it. So in legalese, he has no case to answer on that. It's a legal issue. But again, we have the other part of it. Uh, he who asserts must prove. In criminal law, we say you cannot convict any man unless you prove your case beyond reasonable doubt. If federal government feels it has quantum evidence to convict him, the, it's their case. The burden is on them to do that. After they have done that, we, have, we now mount our defense. Barrister Aloy Ejimako, yes. thank you for your time with us. It's my pleasure having you. Thank you.